السلام عليكم ورحمة الله. It's a great pleasure for me to host this program alongside the Husseini Islamic Center in Peterborough as the head of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Institute for Islamic Studies. The aim of the Institute was for us to have rigorous academic discussion and research. Those of you who have attended my courses at the Institute online would have seen that we're trying to offer as much insight into the history and the sciences of the religion of Islam, both from the perspective of Muslims and non-Muslims. As you know, Islam as a religion has been thoroughly examined in the Muslim and the non-Muslim world. Some of the best works on the religion of Islam have been written by non-Muslim academics. I, in my own lifetime, when I've come to research certain subjects, there are scholars of history or theology or law that I have benefited a great deal from. If I look, for example, while I was at Exeter, the late Professor C.E. Bosworth was my supervisor. And Bosworth is a giant, and Father Clohesse has quoted him in the book. Likewise, Professor Robert Gleave at Exeter as well, who's a giant when it comes to Islamic law. Also, people like Eton Kohlberg, Wilfred Madlung, Fred Donner, Patricia Croner. We may not necessarily all agree on the same conclusions, but it's wonderful when you read the works of academics who may not be Muslim, but may examine the life of the Prophet, peace be upon him, and his family in a way which opens your eyes. And that's why for us at the Prophet Muhammad Institute, it's a great pleasure on this night to welcome Father Christopher Clohesse. Father Christopher Clohesse and myself, we go back a long way, literally and metaphorically. Metaphorically, we go back a long way because I remember first seeing his name in relation to a work on Fatima al-Zahra salam and wondering, this person in South Africa who has written a work on Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam, I'd love to know more about his background. And then the way the Lord works in mysterious ways, not only did I get to know more about his background, but we ended up being close friends who've come together to learn from each other, both in the UK and in Rome. So in the UK, in my time while I was the resident scholar at the Haidari Islamic Center, we invited Father Christopher Clohesse to discuss his book on Lady Zainab. Lady Zainab so if you imagine, he had written on Fatima al-Zahra and then he wrote on Sayyidah Zainab and then he invited me to come and speak at the Pontifical Institute in Rome. And there... I had a couple of presentations. One was on Imam Ali alayhi salam and human rights. And the other one, if I remember rightly, was the development of the houses of Najaf and Qum. And both of those discussions were very fruitful. It was great to go to the library as well, where I felt like all of a sudden I was in Najaf and Qum. Because that's when I realized how he gets all those sources to write these books. I remember seeing Ayatollah al khuis works and Allam al Majlisi's works and Sheikh al Kulaini and Sheikh al Saduq. And so that friendship continued until one day he asked me, What do you think my next book should be on? Imagine he's written a book on Fatima al Zahra. And he's written a book on Sayyidah Zainab salam. And I've always told people, and I told someone earlier today, that I believe that his book on Sayyidah Zainab salam 
is the best book to have ever been written on Sayyidah Zainab in Arabic, English, whichever language you want to quote, it's the best book that's ever been written on Sayyidah Zainab a.s. It's brilliantly researched. And if anyone wants to understand the life of Sayyidah Zainab a.s. with meticulous research from primary and secondary literature, then you must get say, uh, Father Clo Christopher Clohessy's work, Half of My Heart. Imagine the title on the work on Sayyidah Zainab a.s. by someone from the Christian faith. But imagine the title is Half of My Heart. So when he asked me at the time, what should I write on next? I said to him, Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas alayhi salam. It's one thing suggesting to somebody to write on Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas alayhi salam. But it's another thing that person writing on Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas alayhi salam. And it's wonderful for us to be here tonight to have a discussion with him on this work over here. The outrider, Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas alayhi salam, Christopher Paul Clohessy, let us all welcome him as we always do with everybody with the loudest of salawats. <laughs> you, of course, are one of the few people who, when they hear a salawat, knows exactly what it means. Um, and the first question that everybody asks me in relation to you, and I'm going to act as the wasila to make sure that it reaches you, is what got you interested in writing on Shi'ism, generally? Well, generally speaking, I began my Islamic studies in Cairo and then in Rome, and we had a very short course on Shi'i Islam. It was one of many courses. There was one on Fiqh and one on Tafsir, and then Shi'i Islam was one of the courses. And I remember hearing about the Battle of Karbala, and thinking, I'm going to spend the rest of my life studying this battle and the lives of the people who were involved, either physically involved, such as Abu Fadl al-Abbas, al-Hussein, but also remotely involved, like Lady, Lady Fatima watching from, from eternity. Mm. And so I decided to write my doctorate on Lady Fatima because <coughs> one of the things that struck me was that she is greatly loved in the Islamic community, specifically the Shi'i community. There weren't any books about her. There were a few books in Farsi and some texts in Arabic. But there was no book written, for example, in English or in another Western language that could introduce non-Arabic speakers into the life of the Prophet's only surviving daughter. Oh. And so I decided to write on, on her. And as I wrote on her, I discovered Lady Zainab, one of her, her children, and as I wrote on Lady Zainab, I discovered the dreams that happened in and around Karbala, sure, sure. predicting the death of Al-Hussein, so I wrote on those dreams, and then I did run out of ideas then, and I had to ask for some help, who should I write about next? And this book almost ended our friendship, because it was a very difficult text to write. There's very little information about Abul Fadl, I, I, certainly in the earlier texts, and it took quite a lot of work to put things together, and, but I'm delighted now that it is. And again, I think this is the first biography of uh, Abbas written uh, in English, in a Western language, but based on the Arabic sources, so that now non-Arabic speakers are able to read of his life and of his heroism. Normally when a person examines Abel Fadl al-Abbas, at least on my part, when I give lectures, I'd always begin, obviously, with his birth. And you decide to begin this work in that way by straight away talking about his mother. What did you find about his mother? What was unique? And what in the sources in particular struck you about this lady? Well, I think that um, she reminds me of Lady Fatima because in the same way that you could say that the life of Al-Hussein was shaped by his parents, but... Mm. Specifically, our lives are often deeply shaped by our mothers. I mean, it's at their knees that we learn so much about faith. So I foresaw that Al Hussein's life was shaped by the life of his mother in the same way that Al Abbas's life was shaped, certainly by his father, Imam Ali, but also by this, this extraordinary woman, uh, Umm Al Banin, about whom, once again, there, there isn't that much information. But the one thing that we we know about her, even if it's disputed, 
is that after the death of of the heroes of Karbala, Al Hussein, Al Abbas, and the others, she would go to the cemetery every day to mourn and weep over their lives and over their deaths, and that most of her weeping was for Al Hussein before she wept for her own son, Al Abbas. The other thing that fascinated me was that Umm al Banin has ancestry that stretches deep back into the Jahiliya. All of her ancestors were great horsemen. Hmm. And one of her ancestors was known particularly that he was so tall that when he rode his horse, his feet dragged on the ground. And it is one of the characteristics about Al Abbas that he was known to be so tall that he couldn't sit on a horse properly without his feet dragging on the ground. So that in Al Abbas, we see through the ancestry of his mother some of these characteristics that come through. I think more especially, Umm al Banin taught him faith and courage as our mothers teach us. It's very interesting that you, you discuss the idea that he sits on a horse with his feet touching the ground because in the last 10 years within certain Shia communities, especially where I've recited, you'll get people who become very skeptical about some stories. And of course, I don't find a problem with people being skeptical if they're trying to gain knowledge about an issue rather than trying to mock an issue. And sometimes what I would uh, hear from people is saying, do you know how high a horse is? Do you know the height of a horse? Are you seriously telling me that if Abel Fadl al-Abbas salam sits on a horse, you're talking possibly, I don't know, six, seven, seven and a half feet and maybe more. But you seem convinced that it's there in the literature. I'm convinced because, because it's, it's found written about one of his ancestors. Mm. And, and that's what interests me, that, that a, a hardly known... Uh, soldier who I think was living during the Jahiliya, but who was a relative or a distant relative of Umar al-Banin, is specifically known for that, that he was so tall that when he rode a horse, his feet dragged on the ground. And I think, why would they say that of al-Abbas? Mm. Why would they make something up like that? You know, you can talk about him being the moon of the Banu Hashim, and you can talk about his elegance and his grace. Why would you say that his feet dragged on the ground? It strikes me that that's one of these little stories that's probably true because otherwise it doesn't make sense. It's not, a, you know, it's not a compliment. There are lots of ways of complimenting him and saying, oh, he was a hero and he was uh, wonderful in battle and he was kind to children and his feet dragged on the ground when he rode a horse. You think, well, that doesn't make sense. Mm. That's the one that strikes me as being true. When I was writing the book about Lady Zainab, there were little details about Lady Zainab which struck me as fascinating, mostly written by Sunni historians. For example, one historian said that when she came onto the battlefield of Karbala, she rose like the sun rising as she walked onto the battlefield. And I thought, well, why would he say that unless somebody saw something? Another one says her ear, she was wearing earrings and the sun was catching the earrings and flashing. Somebody saw that and put it down into their history that Lady Zainab, when she walked onto the battlefield, a number of things drew eyes to her. And I don't think these are things that are made up. There's no need to make them up. I think eyewitness accounts, people see things, silly little details that become quite important. He's born, and you discussed the sources about his date of birth, um, and he's born on the 20, 26th year after Hijrah, yeah. which... A number of the maqatil conclude that he's a 34-year-old on the plains of Karbala. Yeah. The birth in many of our uh, lectures that we give, the birth is surrounded with this idea of hands, holding hands, you know, emotion at birth. Um, do you see that in the sources? I didn't see much of that. The one thing I found was the question of the naming. Yes. That as with Lady Zainab, so also with Al Abbas, there's a, a putting off of who's going to name him. Yes. And, and nobody wants to take responsibility. And finally, they're leaving it for others, more important people. And finally, his father names him with this very curious name that, that has to do with being ferocious in battle, unsmiling. That's what Al Abbas sure. means. That he's the, the unsmiling one when he faces his enemy and uh, ferocious like a lion who's not afraid of its prey. But it was not Umm al-Banin who named him. Um, she was asked what name she was going to give him, and she deferred to Ali, Imam Ali, to do the naming. But uh, aside from that, as opposed to, for example, the birth of al-Hussein, I didn't find much detail about 
about supernatural sort of events or mm. emotional events surrounding the birth. Yeah, it's interesting. I'm sure many of you know that the name Abbas, you can go back to a particular surah of the Quran which relates to the name Abbas. Who can tell us which surah? Abasa. Surah 80 of the Quran. Abasa. Watawalla. Anja'ahul. A'ma. Abasa watawalla is that controversial yeah. passage in the Quran about the blind man when the Prophet was sitting with a group of people and a blind man came in and wanted to ask him some questions. And the Quran says that he Abasa watawalla. He frowned and turned away. And Ja'ahul A'ma, when the blind one came to him. And the whole idea in the world of tafsir is that the, the Shi'i tafsir, you know, turn around and say, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa would never show bad akhlaq. Whereas the non Shia tafsir went towards which direction? Went towards the direction that, well, you know, the Prophet, at the end of the day, he, he frowned and God reprimands him for the frowning. So it's an interesting correlation there. When I've given lectures on Abel Fadl Abbas in the past, there was something I really wanted to look at here. And that is that we normally first hear about him at the Battle of Safin. And if we're hearing about him on the Battle of Safin, he would be 11 years of age. All of you may have heard the story that his father tells him to come out. Um, onto the battlefield to emerge and so on. You discuss it. You, there's a back and forth about whether it's him or not. Uh, what's your conclusion? And don't worry, no one's going to crucify you. Excuse the pun, of course. I think myself, having read many texts, that it was another Abbas at the Battle of Safin, an older boy. Um, so I don't doubt that Al Abbas was present at the battle. I think he was. Whether he took an active part in the fighting at the age of 11, that's, that's a little more difficult to deal with. Now, it's quite possible that he did, but there are a number of texts that say there was another Al Abbas present who eventually was the one who exchanged clothing and exchanged mm. horses, making him look like his father, <coughs> making him look like Ali, Imam Ali. Yes. So I, 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 it's, it's the same question that came up with Lady Zainab, where is she buried? Mm. I kind of didn't know what to conclude because there's great debate about is it, is it Damascus, is it Medina, where is she? Is it Cairo? And the same with this question. Was he present at Safin? I think he probably was present. Did he take an active part in the fighting? I'm not sure. Sure. It's hard to know. You look at an 11-year-old boy and say, well, could he wield a sword? Um, we know that there was one little boy at Karbala who, who dragged a sword behind him. He came, one of, one of Al Hassan's sons, came onto the field. And he was so young that he couldn't lift the sword. He somewhat dragged it behind mm. him. And Lady Zainab tried to intervene. So I'm, I'm not sure. It's a very popular story because the problem with that story is that's the moment in which Ali names him Qamar, the moon mm. of the Banu Hashim. Mm -hmm. so there he's introduced. So the name sticks. We know that this is one of his epithets, but whether he actually took an active part in the fighting... I'm undecided. So I left it an open question that it's a possibility it was another Al Abbas. One of the most difficult periods is Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas alayhi salam from the death of his father mm. finding enough information on him until we get to Karbala. Yeah. So when I knew that you were writing this book, I was wondering how much are you going to find in that 20 year period? The only thing that I could recall and forgive me, I can't remember if you discussed it or no because obviously you sent me this a while back. The only thing I could recall was Imam al-Hassan's last moments and there's this interaction that takes place between Abbas and Marwan and the wife of the Prophet. Do you discuss that moment? Or? I don't, no. No. It's, it's, it's very interesting because Marwan comes up in the book as a very intriguing character mm. um, because apparently he goes and weeps when he hears Umm al-Banin weeping. Mm. And the question is, did he really? And there's at least one uh, Shi scholar, um, Abdul Razak, Yes. Who just dismisses this. He says she was long dead before the Battle of Karbala. So, no, that wasn't a, a, an issue that came up. I imagine that he lived with his brother Al Hassan until his death, and then with Al Hussein, and finally died with him at Karbala. But to find any other information, um, there was a question of whether he was involved um, with, the, with the vengeance for the, for the death of Ali. But he was not one of those who went out. He's He's left behind because he's too young. Yes. 
So that again draws questions about Safin. Yes. If at the murder of Ali, when some of them go out to get vengeance, he's pushed to the side because he's too young, then maybe he was too young also to be actually fighting at Safin. But it is a very different, as with Lady Zainab, there's a period where we just know very little. I suppose with the Safin Karbala dialogue, in Karbala, the, the opposition clearly know he has a presence. Yes. M my only question mark is, if there was no Safin interaction, where do they gain this idea that this person has a huge presence in this battle? Because he's always, you depict how he's always with his brother and um, they come out together on a number of occasions. Why do you think the opposition is very concerned about his presence? There's, there's, you discussed this uh, relation between him, his mother and Shimmer. Yeah. And on the night of Ashura, day of Ashura, you know, come join us, you're my relative. There's something about him that seemingly is missing from the sources about why they are adamant that you need to get rid of him. What, what do you think that could have been? I think there are three reasons. I sure. think firstly um, is that the reason the book is called The Outrider, the outrider is one who is sent on all these missions. So there are a number of events that happen before the actual battle involving Al-Abbas. Mm. He gets sent to fetch water. According to the earliest Shi'i text, which I think is Abu Mikhnaf, Yes. My Iranian friends disagree with me, but I think Abu Mikhnaf was a Shia. He writes the first great Maktal. In his Maktal, Al-Abbas does not go on the day of Ashura to fetch water. He goes the day before. Mm. Nonetheless, he goes to fetch water. He goes to negotiate with the enemy to find out what they're doing. He goes a second time to the enemy to ask them for time, and they give him time, which means he was a skilled negotiator. He is then given the standard and becomes the standard bearer. I think he would have been a noticeable figure in that battle. He had a presence about him, and if he, he was a big man, even more so, but he is quite clearly the negotiator, the diplomat, the standard bearer. He's also always the one who speaks first. He speaks mm. on behalf of his brothers. So when Shimmer and their two offers of amnesty, in both offers of amnesty, it's Al-Abbas who says, we reject your offer, take it back, we're not interested. So he's also seen to be a spokesperson. And then he is the last man standing, in theory, before the death of Al-Hussein. In fact, there was another survivor who revived after the death of Al-Hussein and was killed immediately. And his name is in the book. He was injured and, and revived, and Al-Hussein was dead. But in theory, Al-Abbas is the last man standing. And it seems to me that together they're trying to get, reach the water, the watering place. So he's highly noticeable. Whether or not there was a Safin uh, uh, relation, mm. I'm not sure. Mm. There might well have been. But I think that the tasks and the words that he spoke on the day of battle and the days preceding it were enough to make him noticed. I, I gave a lecture once where I believe that Imam Zain al-Abidin fought a couple of days before Ashura and that I believe he was injured in a skirmish. And so when people say Imam Zain al-Abidin was ill, to me it was he was injured. There's, it's, there were skirmishes. There skirmishes. Were skirmishes. Yeah. The, this, is the, this is the point that I want to come to. In the lead up to the 10th of Muharram, there were skirmishes clearly taking place. Karbala was not just Ashura day. Absolutely. 7th, 8th, 9th, they were fighting. What, what do you find is happening here? Well, one of the, the great skirmishes, the, the skirmish that's important for me revolves the question of water. Yes. So, so you have this first very early Shi'i text, Abu Mikhnaf, which doesn't exist anymore. It's gone. But we have it in fragments in the Sunni historians. So much of the information about Al-Abbas comes from the Sunni scholars mm. because they tell his story at Karbala. Around the 9th of, of, um, of the month of Muharram, it seems to me that Al-Abbas was sent by his brother with a group to fetch water. In that moment, he wasn't the leader of the group. There was another man who was the leader of the group. But they went together and there was a serious skirmish, but they brought water back. So I imagine that there was more than one of attempt to get water. If the water was cut off on the 3rd or on the 7th, whichever date you go for, they wouldn't have gone once for water. There would have been regular attempts to get to the Euphrates. And I think myself that Al-Abbas went more than once. 
and on at least one occasion he brought water back, and at least one occasion he was killed doing exactly the same thing. I don't think he went only once. And that, for me, ties up the makatil, that you have the Shi makatil, where he fetches water and fights off the enemy on the day of Ashura and dies, but you have a very early Shi text which says, no, he fetched water on the ninth already mm. and was involved in fighting. I can well believe that Zain al-Abidin could have been part of that group and been injured. And he, he, he's got three brothers with him in Karbala. Those brothers hardly get a mention. You discuss them. Yeah, because there's some Shi texts that suggest they went with him to get water mm. and killed doing so. But that doesn't seem to be correct to me. I think that they, they went forward and were killed at his invitation towards the end of the battle. When he saw how many had been killed, Al Abbas turns to his three brothers and invites them, because they are childless, all of them, to go forward. He becomes their heir, and then he himself goes forward, and his son becomes his heir, his surviving son. So I, I spoke a little about the three brothers. I think they deserve a mention. Yes. They were all martyrs. Yes. And quite clearly listened to their brother. So again, you have this image of a man who's got a powerful presence that his brothers accept that he invites them to go and be killed, and they go one by one and are killed. And then he follows them eventually. The scene by the Forat. <coughs> by the Forat, the one that's mentioned in, in uh, many Shia pulpits, is that he's at the Forat and he recites lines of poetry mm -hmm. while he's holding the water. But then there are maqatil that literally just say, Abbas came forward and then he was killed and then his brothers came forward and then he was killed. How do you reconcile the two? Well, the, the story grows, of course, as the, as the generations go by until you have a picture so the first picture is Al Abbas goes to water, fights a little battle, brings water back. The much later picture is Al Abbas towards the end of the battle, fighting his way to the, the river, um, getting water, and then on his way back being literally slaughtered on his way back. I mean, he's shot with arrows and knocked off his horse with a, a tent pole and beaten, and, and then maybe even his arms and legs cut off. That doesn't occur in the early text. It's a much later development. Equally, a later development is that he stands in the water and is about to drink and then throws the water aside and says, why would I think of drinking while Al Hussein is thirsty? Um, but that's only in the later text you find that story. And, and I mean, he's famous for the poetry he recites. Mm. He recites quite a lot of poetry. Arabic poetry is notoriously difficult to translate into English. It doesn't, and it loses beauty. So I've tried to, to translate his poetry as he's riding back. So now you have to picture that he's riding back. In theory, he's holding the banner because he's the banner bearer and you can't let that go. He's holding his sword and he's got one or more flasks of water, perhaps even in his mouth. When one of his arms is cut off, something has to go into his mouth, his sword or something else. But he's still reciting poetry as he rides. So it's a it's a picture that's embellished in some way because these pictures do get embellished. But it's an important story because it's, it's proving his resilience that he simply doesn't give up. That even physical impossibility, Al-Abbas is still going to get water to those women and children. And that's the key to his story. If the details change in some of the texts, did he have his arms and legs cut off? Some people think, some texts think that that was done deliberately after he was killed, because in Islam you don't ever desecrate a body. And it was the enemy soldiers, the soldiers of Yazid, showing how un-Islamic they were anyway. Others say that his arms and legs weren't cut off, but he was killed, felled with a temple. So we've lost the details. It's very difficult to reconstruct the exact story. But I think that you get an amalgam, you get a whole lot of pictures, you put them together, you come to a conclusion, and the point for me is that Al-Abbas is the antidote to ego. That's what he is. Mm. He's completely selfless. That this resilience, that even arrows are not going to stop him getting water to women and children. Women and children, you know, he cares about the children and the women. That's an extraordinary thing in our society today. So in the midst of complete selfishness and people absorbed with themselves, there you have this figure of Al-Abbas, who's got no self. In fact, I said in the book, he's... Difficult to write about because he spends his life hiding behind Al Hussein. A wonderful line. He doesn't want to be seen. Mm. He wants Al Hussein to be seen. So he speaks when he has to, but otherwise he's this silent presence doing what he's told to do. And 
you know, the moon behind the clouds in a sense. Mm. It's a great picture. It's a beautiful line, Father, beautiful line. Even one of my favorite hadiths describing Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas alayhi salam was Imam Zain al-Abideen's portrayal of his uncle in Karbala. So he says, Rahimallah Ammi al-Abbas, which by the way, I remember people used to translate as, may Allah have mercy. I translated it differently. Yeah. I said, Allah has already placed mercy. On my uncle. Yeah, not may Allah. Mm. Rahim Allah can be may or Allah has already placed mercy on my uncle. Rahim Allah, Ammi al-Abbas. وَلَقَدْ آثَرَ وَفَدَى وَوَاسَى أَخَاهُ بِنَفْسِهِ he sacrificed everything altruistically. He selflessly gave everything away. Allah gave him wings. This was my proof, by the way, for the cut arms. Yeah, yeah. This hadith. Because if you go directly, technically, to the literature on the early, it doesn't say right and left arm. What proved to me right and left arm was Allah gave him wings in heaven to replace the arms that he had lost, like his uncle Ja'far bin Abu Talib lost his arms. As you know, Ja'far al-Tayyar lost his arms in the battle of Mu'tah. But the line after that, which I'm sure you're going to complete, I want you to try and explain that line to me about the position that he occupies because of that. What is the line? So, so Zain al-Abideen ends this hadith, which comes, I think, through Sheikh Saduq, mm. comes down through him. He ends it by saying that, that his uncle al-Abbas has a station, um, I think he uses the word station, in paradise of which all the martyrs will be jealous on the day of Allahu resurrection. Allahu Akbar. In, uh, I, I think it's almost the only hadith about Al-Abbas. There are no hadith about Al-Abbas. Mm. It's it's and it comes from an eyewitness, Zain al-Abideen, down to, to uh, Sheikh Saduq, who is a, a reliable. Yeah. Um, and it's this idea of, of that that. Number one, he's at least equal in value with his uncle Jaffa, mm. um, who, who also dies selflessly in battle in very similar circumstances, mm. um, losing his arms on a, as he rides through the enemy. And it was mentioned a lot in Karbala. Yeah, yeah, this is it. There's so this constant reminder of him. A constant reminder, and, and that, but even that, he's higher than him because he's got a place that all the martyrs will envy on, mm. the, on the day of Riz Yawm al-Qiyama. One part I found... And then, inshallah, we'll open the floor for everybody to ask questions. And I know it's a great feeling when you can ask Father Klohesi questions, especially coming from a perspective outside of the religion, but a perspective that loves these personalities. I found interesting that Muqtan al-Thaqafi was, in your last chapter, you discussed the shrine of Abu al-Fadl Abbas. So, Abu al-Fadl Abbas, alayhi salam, dies by the Forat, and he's left there. And afterwards, there's the shrine that's built by Mukhtar al-Thaqafi, but then destroyed, as you say yourself, for some unknown reason by Harun al-Rashid. Rashid, of all people. Who, I, I, I couldn't understand why Harun al-Rashid would be so interested in putting energy on that. Mm. How, how do you look at the sources for his grave burial and so on? Well, I mean, even people like um, Sheikh al-Mufid, Tell us that he lies where he he's buried mm. where he lies. So we know we know that. I mean, it's clear in the sources. What fascinates me is the rise and fall of his tomb because it's destroyed more than once. Yes, and it's constantly having to be refurbished. And from generation to generation, you either have people who are refurbishing it and decorating it, or you have people who are doing everything they can to 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 limit it. And finally, you have what you have today, the tomb that you have today. And I end the book by saying. The, the lower part is flooded with water. Hmm. It's, and it's as though the Euphrates has come to Al-Abbas. Allah. After these centuries that he went to the Euphrates, the river has come back to him so that at the bottom part of the tomb there's water flowing. Um, but I never understood why, um, why a, 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 a caliph like Rashid would, would destroy a tomb. Because yeah. in, theory, in theory, he's one of the kind of learned thinking. But he, he has that hate. Yeah. Which certainly but, but exists. He, but he had this hatred for, for the, the Akhul Bayt or for yeah. the family and he destroys the tomb. Uh, if, uh, you know, on the tomb being destroyed a number of times, I remember reading 
سيد بح... سيد مهدي بحر العلوم one of the erudite scholars many of you would have heard of him the stories about him meeting the 12th imam and so on he says we were rebuilding the shrine of abel fad which highlights to you just randomly again yeah. rebuilding the shrine yeah. it's been destroyed he said i came and spoke um, to the builders and i said to them how's the building going and they said to me it's very nice but there's something we don't understand and he's like what he said you say abel fad when he sat on his horse his feet used to touch the ground so he says yes they said to him, we don't understand how that could be. And he's like, why? And they said to him, his grave is so small. And he says, I began to cry because I wondered, and this could be where your theory comes in about later mutilation of body. Yeah. He said, I wondered how many pieces they cut his body by the time they left him, mm. that his grave, yes, we see a huge dharih, we see a huge shrine in Karbala. But the actual area, he said, when they said that to me, I couldn't stop crying because I wanted really that much. Of course, he's missing his head because his head was one of those taken Sham. To, 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 first to Kufa, Kufa and, and then to Sham, Damascus. Yeah. Yeah. So that's already there. And there was a strong element that the fury of the soldiers uh, about how many enemy he'd managed to kill yeah. caused them to mutilate him quite badly after he was killed. Um, which is a very un-Islamic thing. It's completely forbidden in Islam to do that, but it suggests where they were coming from.